travel and things in association with rugged wear real people real clothing real solutions presents in conversation with i am your host david batsoffen and before i introduce my guest i must tell you that today we're going to be talking about lightning and lightning strikes specifically um, that we here on the high felt have an inordinate amount of them so my guest today is a man that seems to hide in the dark or so we're led to believe if we watch enough TV programs. And that's Professor Ryan Blumenthal. Ryan, welcome to you. Finally, we get to chat, you and I. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Firstly, let's, let's deal with this myth of pathologists living um, in the dark and, and doing strange and wonderful things. What is the actual job that you do? Right. Well, I think the paradigm has changed. I mean, in the past, forensic pathologists and pathologists always worked in the basement of some hospital. <laughs> yeah. But nowadays, if you look what's happening internationally, you've got state-of-the-art facilities made out of glass. I mean, it's, we're really in the light nowadays, and I think okay. that's important. Okay. So your specialty, or if correct me if I'm wrong, is lightning and deaths around lightning, both human and animal. I did not realize that this was a specialty or that we had enough of them in South Africa to warrant it. Well, there's a few of us on the planet. Uh, the, the correct <laughs> name is coronopathology, corono being the Greek word for lightning okay. and pathology. So it's the pathology of trauma of lightning on the human or animal body, coronopathology. Okay. Wow. Now, are there different types of lightning? Specifically here on the high felt. All right. So, look, lightning is, it's, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm a storm chaser at heart, and I think that's why I got into this. It is so beautiful, yet it is so dangerous. Yeah. And here on the South African high felt, as I've always said, it's more impressive than the northern lights. I mean, <laughs> we get 40 to 70 thunderstorm days per year, and it is just spectacular to behold. However, they, it causes death. Now, you asked about different types of lightning. The science of lightning is quite hectic, and I don't want to bore your viewers. Um, but basically, um, you get positive lightning, negative lightning, upward lightning, and downward lightning. And 90% of lightning is negative downward lightning. And the way to remember that is that 90% of people are generally negative and down. <laughs> what does your quote, uh, when thunder roars, get indoors? <laughs> it's like yeah, Look... It was actually invented, I think, in America, that quote, but I'm trying to, um, I'm just in distribution here in Africa. <laughs> I just want enough. that, I want that quote out there, when thunder roars, go indoors, because I think that's, a, it's, a, it's an entirely preventable death. This is not yeah. like AIDS or TB or one of those things. This is something that is easily preventable just by following a simple rule, when thunder roars, go indoors. There was a fellow in America some years ago, Ryan, um, I think his nickname was Lucky. He'd been struck eight times by lightning and survived every time. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm quite skeptical of such stories. You know, I need evidence. I'm a scientist at heart. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very curious about such cases. I, one hears of them from time to time. However, I, I, need, I need more evidence. So, look, the chances of being struck by lightning are actually greater than winning the lottery. Um, if you look, <laughs> look, so South Africa, we lose about 80 to 100 people per year. And incidentally, just speaking statistics here, the chances of you dying on, your, on the way to purchase a lottery ticket in South Africa are greater than actually winning the lottery. Oh, if you look God. at the amount of yeah, pedestrian vehicle accidents or murders or suicides, <laughs> the chances of dying, just buying your lottery ticket are, are higher. <laughs> Because I was going to suggest you get the lottery ticket and then go and stand out in a field during a, a thunderstorm and see what happens, whether you win the well, lottery or get struck by lightning. Struck by lightning is probably the condition that medical doctors will see the most because, look, for every one dead, 10 will survive. And other literature says for every three dead, seven will survive. So the chances, so for me, it's the biggest weather killer you know i see more i do more autopsies on lightning victims than for example tornadoes or floods or, yeah. or a heat stroke or anything else so lightning is my bread and butter i mean over the last 20 years as a forensic pathologist i've done 90 autopsies on lightning cases and, do, and that's why i'm so interested in it do they come to you sort of 
I, I hate to sound crass, but like charred and burnt, or what are the signs that when you look at a body, you immediately go, this person's been hit by lightning? End of story. Right. Well, that's what makes this field so fascinating. It's the coronopathology. There's a lot of myths out there. What you're discussing is what's known as the crispy critter myth. Yeah. So lightning does not cause crispy critters. The signs of lightning on the human or animal body are actually very subtle. Um, you've actually got to seek them out. You've got to notice these things. So, right. for example, we'll, we'll find someone dead on the side of the road. Yeah. Now, you don't know if they've been hit by a car or if they've been murdered and dumped there. Or is this lightning? For example, where they're walking home late afternoon and, and got struck by lightning. So, all the good stuff in forensic pathology is generally found on the outside of the body. Whereas in anatomical pathology, all the good stuff's found on the inside of the body, you know, on the organs, the cancers yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff. But in forensics, it's the clothing, it's the skin, you know, it's the hair. You know, that's where we have to seek out the pathology. And over the last 20 years, I've found some incredible stuff, uh, my colleagues and myself internationally, of what lightning causes. So just to get philosophical here, you know, lightning takes a millisecond. So what is the essence of this thing? I mean, what is lightning? Is it... Is it heat? Is it electricity? Is it magnetic? Is it, you know, and you've got one millisecond to try and ascertain what this thing is. However, low cards exchange principle, every contact leaves a trace. Lightning leaves traces of itself on people and the ground and clothing. And because of these traces of itself, we get an understanding of the essence of what lightning is. Okay. So, Short, a long answer to a short question, but a, a very involved and very interesting answer. Thanks for that, Ryan. So what to do in an electrical storm? That picture that I showed you earlier was one of the few lightning images that I've ever taken. And I was standing on a hill in Milder's Drift with my camera on a tripod in that storm. I got 12 images. I had people screaming at me, come inside, come inside. I went, no, I want these photographs. Um, firstly, what were my chances of getting struck? And secondly, how stupid was I? All right, so th this is actually a fascinating question. And the authority in South Africa on lightning photography is a guy called Neil Deploy. It's actually a super speciality. They use triggered lightning cameras, etc. So, and, and obviously, it's that storm chaser mentality and trying to capture this thing that takes place in a millisecond. And I mean, they're incredible shots. I have to take my hat off to you. That is a perfect shot that you got there. But your chances are, firstly, are minimal. Just no, no, no. But your chances, as I say, in South Africa, of actually sustaining an unnatural death just by being outside in the middle of the night in a car alone, uh, suffering an, an incident, is is actually greater than lightning. Sorry, I'm a. I look at stats here, and so you safety is paramount. Yeah. Do not tempt fate. That is my okay. big lesson in life. Do not tempt tempt fate. Fate. You are safe inside a car. A car is a Faraday cage or Gaussian surface area. So it's not the tires that protect you in the car. It's the fully enclosed metallic surface uh, area. So, so that is important. Look, um, there's risk in everything in life. And uh, I mean, you suffer for your art, clearly. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's worth it for that photograph. And just giving a little anecdote here, just to show you like what we're dealing with here. So once I got an email from Britain, because this tourist was actually watching leopards in in uh, in, in Southwest Africa at the time, and or, or Namibia, and there was an electrical thunderstorm, and they were watching leopards mating in an open top Land Rover type vehicle. And this gentleman from Britain wrote to me saying that he believed that the tour company put him and the guests at risk right. during an electrical thunderstorm, and he wants to sue the um, the travel company so they wanted an expert opinion from myself about you know what were their risks mm. i mean you, you're watching leopards mating which everyone comes to africa to see i mean it's an incredibly rare experience it is indeed yet, yet you're in an open top land rover vehicle and you there's an electrical thunderstorm so so how did i think about this what was my answer and i really um i suffered for this answer which i'm going to give you here because i discussed many ethicists and people so <laughs> So the answer that I gave the, the tourist companies, okay, look, firstly, they need a policy. You, you, you need a policy and the game raging associations needs to know what to do, like Fugasa and all these game raging companies, like 
what would the reasonable game ranger do in such a situation and what would happen yeah. elsewhere in the world okay so you need a policy at the outset number two is we came up with this concept called the dangerous neighborhood uh, metaphor some neighborhoods are more dangerous than other neighborhoods so if you walk through some neighborhoods your chances of being attacked are greater than other neighborhoods so your risk increases in an electrical thunderstorm and there are cases of people being struck in over in, in OSVs, you know, without a roof. Mm -hmm. Also, people paid big money to see these leopards mating. And now suddenly you, you go to abort mission and head back to camp. But let me just tell you the, the final answer. The final answer is this. The inconvenience of stopping the sighting or stopping the rugby game or stopping the gala or stopping the netball game and going home is less than the inconvenience of a dead person. Mm. So this is how we thought about it. So rather live another day, um, we, we have to take lightning seriously. It does kill and injure. And, and I just see the dead ones, but my colleagues who see the living lightning struck victims, it's really traumatic. These people develop cataracts. They can't hear, they can't walk, they can't talk. Lifelong disability. I mean, they get shunted around from pillar to post, from ENTs to occupational therapists to physiotherapists to GPs to neurologists. It costs houses of money, and it is entirely preventable. Just get indoors. So, again, uh, when thunder roars, get indoors. It's as simple as that. If, if at all in doubt, play the safety card. Walk away, live to take another picture, live to enjoy another swimming gala, whatever the case might be. Here in Southern Africa, Ryan, are there myths and legends, specifically from a cultural point of view, around lightning and what it means um, for certain members of our population? All right. So the expert on this field was, well, is Professor Estelle Trengrove from University of Witwatersrand. She did a PhD on myths and beliefs surrounding lightning. And I, I, look, I don't want to step out of my field here, you know, but a mere forensic pathologist, you know, just doing autopsies. However, in my lectures and talks around the country, I mean, you cannot believe how many myths and beliefs there are around lightning. Mm. And it's, it's all cultures. I mean, someone invariably after a talk will come up to me and say, you know, you have to cover mirrors or the color red or syringa trees attracts lightning or you can send lightning. Or, I mean, you, you, you hear it all. And you've got to look for the golden thread that runs through all these myths and beliefs. And that is that previous generations, not knowing the tripole theory of thunderstorm and lightning development, okay, had a way of telling their uh, next of kin and next generation that, hey, lightning is dangerous. Be careful of this thing. So what better way to say be careful than, you know, get some cultural belief around it and pass it on you know, because all these things have, I mean, they have fear and danger in mind. I was about to say, society. basically scare, scare the crap scare out them. of future generations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing positively reinforcing about all these things. They're all negative reinforcement based. <laughs> yeah. It's like, don't do this or else like, you know, we'll, we'll, the lightning will the, strike you. <laughs> yeah. So, so all of them have that in common. And it's like just saying, hey, be careful, beware. Um, lightning is dangerous. Because obviously they didn't all know the tripole or dipole theory of lightning and thunderstorm development. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Ryan, you've just attended a conference in Cape Town. It was at the um, early in October. Um, tell us a bit about that and what came out of that. All right. So this conference uh, happened from the 2nd to the 7th of October, um, 2022. And this, the name of this conference was RCLP, the International Conference of Lightning Protection. My colleagues from WITS were instrumental in bringing this to the African continent. And it's the first time that it's ever been held on, the Afri on African soils in over 50 years. And this is the biggest lightning conference on the planet. It is multidisciplinary and it's everything to do with lightning protection. So we had about, I think, almost 200 papers presented. We had over 68 countries coming to Cape Town International Convention Center. I think it was a huge success. There were people from all different industries, you know, from the wind turbine guys to the photovoltaic vault guys to aviation to weapons depot guys to mere forensic pathologists like myself. Everyone uh, was there talking lighting protection, you know, and 
we all have to talk the same language because there's different specialities and each yeah. person is a conspiracy against the laity and other professions. You know that. <laughs> so you, you have to communicate between people. I actually presented an interesting paper on 93 sheep that were killed in the Karoo. Um, but it was so fascinating because, and incidentally, have you any idea how much 93 sheep cost? Just by the way. Probably over 100,000 rand. Uh, so it's about uh, 500,000 rand, 30,000 US dollars to wow. international listeners. And they were lost in one millisecond. But now here's the fascinating thing. These sheep were dead over a kilometer, about 200 meters with one strike. And if you go into history um, for mass sheep deaths, the largest world record of mass sheep deaths, and you can Google fact check me here, happened in 1939 in Utah. 835 sheep were killed in one strike. And we had 500 dead uh, in Georgia and in Nepal. We had hundreds of sheep dead. So I don't know why sheep are so susceptible to the lightning. I mean, we don't get such large deaths for cattle. Mm -hmm. But one singular strike wiped out over a kilometer by 200 meters, wow. 93 sheep. Fascinating. I mean, this causes, yeah, this causes wonder. And we don't know it all. Like I must say, I had all the experts there and it just blew our minds as to the mechanism how these sheep over such a large area died with one now, singular strike. Now, a, a silly question, perhaps, Ryan, is are those sheep edible? All right, I mean, so could you bribe them? Okay, well, that is an excellent question. And we have, I have been approached by farmers around the country saying that there's delayed post-mortem scavenging of lightning-struck carcasses. I mean, there's yesterday another article that just came out of a giraffe in, in Kruger National Park that was struck. And the predators only started scavenging two days after the death. And I published an article on delayed postmortem scavenging of a lightning struck carcass in Palabora. Mm -hmm. It was, also happened on a farm where there were lions and, and hyenas and vultures. And they only um, started eating on the, carcass, on, on the carcass day five onwards. Interesting. So, uh, this is fascinating <clears throat> stuff. So I've discussed this, you know, maybe there's a smell around the carcass, like some amines or some simte, or maybe it's difficult to get into these carcasses. However, when cattle are struck and then they're sent to lion farms to feed the lions afterwards, the lions eat them, no problem. And actually, you know, there's no problem uh, with, with the meat. It can be mm. eaten. I, okay. I, we don't know why the, there's a delay, though, but it's perfectly edible. Okay. Now, you published a book, what was it, two years ago, called Autopsy. Yes, Autopsy, um, Life in the Trenches. There you go. Is it still available? And where can people find it? Because I find you a very fascinating man, and I find your sense of humor interesting um, because of cartoons that I've seen on your Facebook pages. And I go, <laughs> dark humor. Thank you. But that's the way you keep yourself sane, I should imagine, working in a yeah. basement. Yeah, no, look, I mean, if you're surrounded by death every single day um, and you risk your life for other people's death, the first thing you need is plants in your office, as you've seen, <laughs> and the next thing you need is uh, um, a good sense of humor. So, yeah, I wrote this book, Autopsy, published by Jonathan Ball Books in August 2020, and I did do quite well. It, it became a, a bestseller, and I've had tremendous feedback. It's quite a good book, if I do say so myself, in shameless self-promotional uh, way, sure but uh, yeah, it's it's worth reading. Uh, it's it's very okay. interesting because it's it's light. It's light. Yeah, because you you need to be. I mean, this is a a dark a dark subject, and it's it's one that people steer away from. You know, you don't get met by your patients. Um, because your patients don't know that they're meeting. Put it that way. You they, they, they have, when they uh, arrive. <laughs> They still have families that are very much alive, and you you're still dealing with living humans with yeah. all. Uh, on force so you still have to deal with families and lawyers and detectives and the public so okay. you you by no means hidden Safe. from society yeah yeah we're heading now um as we talk um into um summer here on the high felt which means thunderstorms we've already had a couple of threats of thunderstorms in johannesburg not much rain but lots of noise not much lightning so with the upcoming storms, just to sort of round off our chat run, um, what do you see? We, we, we know that when thunder roars, go, go indoors. But if you're unable to, what are the myths? Should you stand under a tree? Should you try and dig yourself a hole in the ground? Um, if you don't have a car close by, what do you need to do in order to keep yourself safe and alive? 
Okay, this is excellent question. So number one is you've got to know the enemy. So lightning will kill you between 3.30 in the afternoon and 6.30 in the evening. Okay. So that's the time that you're walking home from work or coming home from a hike or coming back to base camp or wherever. So you know that's when our thunderstorms strike. Number two, I would say is know the 30-30 rule. So 30 seconds between flash and bang, you're at risk. So 30 seconds from the lightning to the thunder, you're at risk. And you should wait 30 minutes after the last rumble to continue onwards. Phones have beautiful apps on it now that can warn of lightning, and you must take them seriously. In fact, Prof. Jandrell and myself wrote the SARU guidelines, South African Rugby Union guidelines. So there should be a, light, a lightning umpire for rugby and soccer and crickets and school goalers. Stop the game. The inconvenience of stopping the game is less than the inconvenience of a dead player. Okay. Um, if if you in the open, try get under Eskom lines if they're still there. You know that is a that is a wonderful place to be. No, <laughs> you're safe. Working right. <laughs> it's the it's the why it's what's okay. known as the theory the theory of equipotentialization. So okay, you so you mean Eskom under... may be useful for something. This is it. Yeah, if you stand directly under the lines, you're quite safe. Okay. Um, get inside a fully enclosed metallic surface area if you can, a Faraday cage or Gaussian cage. If you're tenting, get out of the tent, get into your car. Um, wait. If there's a storm, try find an overpass. If you've made enough bad mistakes, you're on the escarpment, it's raining and lightning all around you, and I mean, you can literally feel sparks coming off your head, <laughs> then what I would suggest is the following. You want to maybe squat down. Uh, you want to be wet. If you're wet, maybe you'll get flash over. If you dry, you die. Um, maybe you want to block your ears because, I mean, my lightning victims have ruptured eardrums. And with the rest of your hands, pray, grab things, <laughs> do whatever, you're in trouble. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a good way to end that. Uh, I was hoping for a bit more positive, but yeah. if if in but again, if in doubt, um, if thunder roars, get indoors. It's as simple as that. You can take photographs from inside. Um, that particular photograph that that I showed at the beginning um, was taken outside. But the following night, I went back to that um, that camp, and I sat inside the doorway. And I just shot away because, like you say, it's difficult shooting when you don't have flash um, lightning triggered equipment and you just got to guess when the lightning is going to happen. So it's very hit and miss often. Ryan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. It really and truly has. I've learned a heck of a lot. I'm going to make darn sure that when I'm in the bush, if these sort of things happen and there is mating or there are mating leopards in front of me, we'll leave them alone to their privacy and and head back to the camp rather than put ourselves in danger. I've also I've loved this interview. Thank you so much for persisting and thank you for allowing me to, to share my message. With it's your only a pleasure. My guest today, yeah. Prof. Ryan Blumenthal, who is a forensic pathologist, but whose specialty is? Lightning. Lightning. But what is the and word? Thunder, and, thun and thunderous applause. Thunderous applause. <laughs> But what was the word you used, Ryan? So people Cor can look at Corona pathology. Corona pathology. pathology. There we go. Yes. Prof, thank you so much for chatting to me. It's been thank an you. absolute pleasure. Enjoy your day. Be safe.